and ordained an elder in the Nazarene Church. I have a number of years in pastoral ministry in various contexts. And I'm also a clinical psychologist and really feel called to support pastors and ministry leaders out of that expertise. And so I want to share with you um, some of what I have been learning uh, for research and that I've been part of around clergy health, the kinds of things that promote healthy, sustainable ministry over time. And I'm also uh, thrilled to share this time with Dr. Rebecca Lairs. Um, I'm going to have you say your title again because I'm going to mess it up if I try. Hi, hey, everybody. Nice to see you. You're hanging in there. I know it's a lot of information being uh, sent your way. I am Professor of Christian Ministry and Practice here at Point Loma. I graduated from Point Loma a billion years ago when I wanted to get a couple more degrees. <laughs> and then I came back six years ago. Uh, I used to work in a theological school. And uh, my great love in life is to help clergy be formed and prepared for serving the church. Um, I've been ordained in the Church of Madeline for almost 22 years, um, served global churches, and uh, just want to see you all love God, love neighbor, love the church. So let's hope we do that today. Amen. And uh, Dr. Laird has had a number of leadership roles in various churches and institutions, and uh, there are unique challenges for women in leadership as well, and I'm proud to be part of the denomination that has ordained women since its inception. Um, and sometimes there's a little bit of a, of a double standard with that, or we'll ordain women, but you won't actually get a church on a particular right? So there's some of those kinds of double messages that get sent. So we'll maybe, if we get time, we're going to have time in this session to touch on some of that as well. But a lot of what we're going to share, I think, really applies to both men and women, and they express themselves a little bit differently. But I want to suggest to you um, that we need to pay attention to our women. Paul's formula in 2 Corinthians is this, that we first receive strength, comfort, healing, in a holistic sense, from God for ourselves, before we can be a conduit of that for other people, or pass it on to other people. And so if we really don't allow God to, to lead us into healing and wholeness every way, then uh, we run a risk of wounding other people out of our own woundedness. Because of the, the power of the role that you will have or do have already. The way people relate to pastors is such that we have really an incredible amount of power. Rebecca's going to talk about that a little bit later, the implications of that. But we, we can actually do harm if we're not careful. We don't know ourselves well, pay attention to some things. So we want to encourage you um, at the outset here to uh, to pay attention to some key things that we're going to share with you. That seem to be the kinds of things that new pastors will be healthy, will be ethical, but will also thrive over the long haul. Because we really hear praise to thrive and flourish. Amen. Um, quickly, we don't have time to go in depth with this. So I would have you do this around tables if you have time, but we don't. But so just shout out from your table, nice and long, or anybody can hear. What are some of the joys of ministry? What are the things that get you out of bed on a Sunday morning because you can't wait to go do these things? What what gives you the most joy, the most passion, the most energy in ministry? Anybody? What are the joys? See people saved. Pardon? See people saved. See people saved. Yeah, nothing like that, right? When somebody first comes to Christ. Isn't that an amazing thing to be part of? Just as a Christian? Yeah, absolutely. What else? Touching lives. Absolutely. Say more. In what way? Moving somebody in ways they never thought they could be moved. Realizing the special presence of God in their life. Yeah. Helping somebody become aware of God's presence in their life. Yeah. yeah. What, a, what a joy that is. And people, you really see the the lights start to go on, so to speak. And people really get in touch with God. Just nothing like that. What else? What brings you joy? <coughs> Nobody else has any joys in ministry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Seeing children 
And God speaks to children in, in very special ways, right? But seeing children be nurtured in faith in the Christian community, you know, what a wonderful thing. Yeah, what else? A couple more. What brings you joy? Seeing multiple generations all work. Ah, yeah, absolutely. What, where else besides church do intergenerational relationships happen anymore? You ever thought about that? Not very many places are there old people and babies and everything in between all kinds of life together. Um, pretty unique thing that we're carving out this space in, as pastors for this intergenerational kind of relationships. One or two more. What brings you joy? Donuts and coffee. Donuts and coffee. <laughs> yeah. Because actually, I think that's where most things happen. When you're drinking coffee and just socializing, I think that's right. But, but, even more at times seeing the pastor's sermon, yeah. what's going on is the, like you said earlier, I think is that breaking the bread, that being real with each other, yeah. I think is, probably, is actually probably the most important and most realistic thing to a lot of people. That's that's right. Well said. Yeah, the community, the relationship, the fellowship, the body, beautiful thing. When it happens the way that God intended, there's nothing more beautiful than the, than the body of Christ. Um, now, having said that, anybody love to preach, too? Yeah, one or two people? I'm doing that. Baptizing people, marrying people, even being there for people in crises, visiting people in the hospital, being there for people who are grieving. You know, any number of sort of secret joys in ministry. So as we go through what we're going to go through, I, I want to keep that in mind and encourage you to remind yourself about that from time to time, because it's easy to lose sight of that sometimes, isn't it? When ministry gets hard or discouraging or complex, which it does, uh, sometimes it's easy to forget uh, some of those joys. So one of the things we can do to help ourselves is to kind of contemplate those, remember uh, the joys. I want to talk with you about um, <clears throat> the implications of the statement that a mentor of mine of saying, again, Archibald Clark, who was really one of the first person people to research ministry stress and burnout uh, back in the 70s in a unique way. And he likes to say this, the pastors don't get into trouble, meaning burning out, leaving ministry prematurely, engaging in unethical misconduct, whether that's crossing sexual boundaries or other addictive behavior or whatever it is. Pastors don't get into trouble because we forget we're pastors. We get into trouble because we forget we're persons. You're a person before you're a pastor. In other words, you're a human being, and that comes with some implications and limitations that we can learn to embrace. Um, and you're filling a, a symbolic role. It's a very important role. It's a very sacred and holy thing that we're called to. But we can... We can allow our identity to get so fused with the role in ways that actually are really unhealthy that lead us to neglect taking care of ourselves in certain ways, that lead us to not be aware of some of the things we need to be mindful of if we're going to actually engage in that role in a way that, uh, that is ethical and effective. Um, this is a chart, and by the way, we're going to email you this PowerPoint, so uh, you don't have to scratch all this down. This is the chart. It's a large study done across a lot of different denominations, very large, well done research. The main reasons pastors leave ministry prematurely before they should be done. Uh, the top two are voluntary, meaning it was the pastor's choice to leave. So the first one there is preference for other kind of ministry, often a more specialized kind of ministry, or the need to care for family or children it was significant enough that it just was too hard to do that and be in pastoral ministry in some form. And then the rest of them are involuntary or partly involuntary. I mean, it wasn't the pastor's choice to leave. Uh, conflict in congregations um, seems to be really significant in, in North America anyway. More and more difficult all the time for pastors. They I mean, have such a polarized culture anymore. And people are bringing the conflict to church and things that are difficult. Conflict with denominational offices or disillusionment with the Church of Nazarene. I'm sure that's never happened to anybody in this room. Um, I would put myself in that one every time in my life. Uh, burnout, frustration, feeling of constraint, sense of inadequacy. Uh, another study says that 90%, 90% of pastors feel inadequate in training for their role. I think a lot of that has to do with the complexity of the role. There are just so many things that would be nice to be great at as a pastor. You think about it. You're expected to be 
be an expert communicator, a biblical exegete, a scholar, a theologian, a pastoral counselor, um, crisis counselor, marriage counselor, um, respected to have expertise in organizational leadership as you're leading this organization and running board meetings and community meetings and having to do church budgets and accounting and market the church and have the website up and going. And that's a whole area of expertise anymore than the left the case of technology. When you start thinking about the different areas it would be nice to have some expertise in, it's an enormous breadth. You with me? It's one of the reasons we talk about strengths here in a weekend like this, is we want to encourage you to not put pressure on yourself to have to be an expert in all of those things. That's what pastors often do. And they end up carrying around really a sense of shame. I'm not good enough because if I were, I would be great at all these things. It's just not, it's not humanly possible to be great at all these things. You're a human being. You could spend the rest of your life in grad school and still not have enough degrees to cover all of that ground, right? So give yourself permission to be who you are, to not be something you're not, and to go with your strengths. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, allegations of sexual misconduct. This is allegations. The actual rate of sexual misconduct is much, much higher. In fact, it's higher than the other health professional in the clergy. It's higher than physicians, doctors, lawyers. Um, it's way higher than it should be. And that, that's only the ones that we end up knowing about, right? There are probably lots that, that never get reported. Um, so it's it's way too high. And so that's why we're going to emphasize uh, that piece here today as well. And then problems in family divorce. The, the stress that ministry puts on marriage and on family is unique. In some ways, unlike any other role, because of the, the social, unique social position that clergy and the families um, so these are the kinds of things we know from research lead to leaving ministry premature. And I want to talk to you about the impact of ministry stress. Um, and just give you the bottom line for the sake of time. <clears throat> ministry is an adrenaline demanding profession. Without realizing it, I think a lot of what I'm about to show you in terms of the physical health of clergy, what we now know from research, is due to over taxing our stress hormones 24-7 because of the nature of the role. Uh, without realizing that pastors are constantly calling upon their adrenaline and cortisol and a bunch of other stress hormones without taking proper time to take a break from work, including taking a mental break, without sleeping enough, without taking a Sabbath. Um, I recently went to a conference in New York City with Pete Scudero on the Rosario pastor in Queens, New York. He required everybody on this pastoral staff to take a true 24-hour Sabbath every week. In fact, they just fired a youth pastor from this church because he worked too much to prepare him. Right? He was a workaholic. They kept working with him, and he wouldn't change his pattern, so they let him go because he would not incorporate the Sabbath as a principle to his weekly rhythm. But he put two, up two pictures um, at the beginning of this conference. One was picture of the Greek god Atlas in front of Rockefeller Center in New York City where they do the big skating ring and tree lighting thing on TV every year. And it's the Greek god Atlas on one knee and the, the, the globe, the world, is on his shoulders. He's holding up the weight of the world on his shoulders, barely able to hold it up, right? Straining. And he put up that image and this is where a lot of us live in ministry and leadership. So, but I want to show you another picture that's right across the street inside of the cathedral in New York City. And it's a statue about this high of Jesus as a boy, four or five years old maybe, effortlessly holding the world in one hand. And that's where we could live. That's where we're called to live. The pastors, your church is not held together because you're holding it all together. Your church is held together because it's the church of Jesus Christ and he is holding it together. Which means, guess what? You can take a break every now and then. Somehow while we slept last night, God kept the universe going. Right? Big relief. I woke up this morning. If you cannot rest and take a break from ministry, he said to these pastors who are stealing the material, we're essentially functional atheists. Pretty strong. Pretty true. If I 
can't trust that God's going to keep stuff going while I take a break. That I'm somehow indispensable to the work of God in this community. For me to revisit some, some things that we really believe in the heart about how God actually works. Um, what we know about clergy is this. They have a higher rate of what's called metabolic syndrome than the general population of the United States. Metabolic syndrome is three of these five things. If you have three of these five, you have metabolic syndrome. A large abdominal circumference of a certain size, which would likely be moving toward obesity the way a physician would diagnose that, which is, of course, an epidemic in North America, right? The rate of obesity is just off the charts in, in the culture. <coughs> high blood pressure, high bad cholesterol, which is the triglycerides, low good cholesterol, which is HDL, and then high fasting blood sugar. Um, blood sugar is connected to what disease? That you describe. You have three of those five. You are at exponentially higher risk for heart attack, cardiovascular disease, stroke, diabetes, arthritis. Pastors die more often of those things than the general population in the United States because they have a higher rate of metabolic syndrome. So why is this going on? And part of what we think is happening, again, is that a lot of these disease processes can be traced back to over arousal of stress hormones over a long period of time. And it's one thing during Holy Week to crank out like an 80 hour week in ministry because it's just what it takes that particular week. Right? Sometimes that's just the way it is. A couple people die in the congregation and give you like a consult your schedule before they die. And all of a sudden that's planning funerals, you know, you're attending to people. When are you gonna have time to prepare the priest except Saturday night at like midnight? It's what happens sometimes. One week, as long as you give yourself some time to recover after that, is not going to be detrimental. But it's doing that week after week after week, month after month, without pacing yourself, without taking a break, that leads to a lot of physical health problems. Um, and I'm just going to be honest with you this morning. Grew up in the Church of the Nazarene, loved the Church of the Nazarene. Uh, deep affection for it. And been to a lot of general assemblies. Anybody ever been to general assembly or the district assemblies? You can walk around in general assembly and, and it's a metabolic center of convention. <laughs> right? Can we just talk about our family brokenness here for a second in the family? Um, I wonder if there's a hidden food addiction problem in our tradition. We talk a lot about alcohol, and rightly so. Not a lot of good things come from alcohol. About self neglect, overeating, obesity. The same principle, I think, in our holiness theology, is it not? Um, we, need to, we need to think about modeling these kinds of things for our, our folks. So, a lot of causes for this, I think a lot of it has to do with a physiological over arousal chronically over time, where we're not paying attention to the not resting, not taking care of ourselves, not exercising. One study I mentioned uh, last hour says that pastors in America exercise once a month. Um, we need to do it more often than that, right? To be healthy. Um, and there are a variety of other things we can talk about, but I think what I want to mention here is that sometimes there are some some deeper reasons why pastors can love themselves. Let me just ask you all: what? You don't have to talk about yourself or anybody in the room. Talk about pastors you know even non-Nazarene pastors, or you can talk about Nazarene. Why don't we take care of ourselves as a group of people, generally speaking? Why, why do you think that is? Anybody have thought about that? What's your theory? Worrying about everybody else. Yeah, always caring for everybody else. Time. Time. Yeah. Just don't have the time. Ah. Say more. Say it about our own vulnerability. Um, so perhaps being really busy and caring for everybody else is actually a way of avoiding taking a look at some stuff I need to look at myself. But it looks very servant-like on the surface, right? Yeah. You guys are a great insight. What else? Why else don't we take care of ourselves? You guys have thought about that? Sometimes it's not valued system or it's not valued by a particular congregation. 
congregation can't see you as a person who actually needs a vacation every year, who needs a time off every week. <coughs> Probably lots of reasons for this. One of the things that I think can happen without realizing is we can buy into uh, a theology of spiritual formation that's very one-dimensional, where we sort of compartmentalize spirituality, say something like this, that as long as I'm spiritually doing well, I'm not going to heaven and everything, it doesn't matter what's happening with this temporary thing we call a body, or my emotions, or my relationships. Um, in the, one of the studies that these stats come from called the Duke Clergy Health Initiative, the, the way pastors responded to our surveys and we did in-depth physical uh, health, physicals and blood work and everything on all these pastors, Basically, they said this, I, I'm clinically obese, I have metabolic syndrome, and I'm clinically depressed, the way a psychologist would diagnose depression. But my spiritual vitality is really high, and that, none of that really affects my ministry at all. Well, how is that even possible? That you could be that physically, emotionally, and emotionally that not impact your ministry at all. Denial. Yeah. Is that what you said? Yeah. It's a funny form of denial. It does not look at spiritual formation the way I think scripture calls us to, which is holistic. It involves all of who we are, our bodies, our relationships, our emotions, our thinking. Um, we have often a, a well-developed theology of ministry in our head, but I think the way we know what we really believe is when we look at our day plan. Right? How, how is that really being lived out in the rhythms? And that's one of the reasons we're encouraging you to develop this rule of life over here. Um, we also know that pastors have a significant rate of depression. And so I want to normalize that for everyone. Um, most pastors, even the greatest pastors among us in the Church of the Nazarene, just given the stress and strain of leadership and all the challenges of the culture and the complexity of the role, go through at least a season of mild and moderate depression at some point in your industrial career, largely created by the job or the role and the other factors, of course, in depression. Some of us have a history of that or genetic vulnerability to that from the family and different things going on here. But I just want to normalize that and invite you to be gentle with yourself if you find yourself even coming into the group and struggling with depression for whatever reason. You're a person. You're a human being. You're likely going to experience some of this at some point. And so it's there to listen to, participate with it, and, and seek help. But what we often do as pastors is we say something internally to ourselves like, I should not be feeling this because I'm a pastor. So we beat ourselves up for being depressed, which does what? It's worse. As opposed to noticing it, Reflecting on why might this be happening to me right now, and taking the proper steps to uh, to be cared for in that, whether that means changing your exercise habits, uh, seeking professional counseling, or talking on a certain vacation for a while. Um, just want to encourage you to be gentle with yourself and pay attention to that. It's very common, and and I would say normal. Uh, and that's true of other helping professions that have a lot, do a lot of work with people and are sort of immersed in the suffering and loss of other people in the past few um, It's just a common thing. Um, all right, so last thing I want to touch on before I write it up here. Um, so the adrenaline over arousal is a big deal. The other big deal uh, in ministry um, or finding research is, is isolation. Ministry leadership is just an isolating role. It's socially isolating. Anybody ever gone to a party and walk a group of people who are joking or laughing and they see you there and it just shuts down real quick? Because now the pastor's here. So we got to get out of this behavior. You, know? um, you ever wrestle with what to say to somebody on a plane when they ask you what you do? Mm -hmm. You don't know what people are going to do with that if you say pastor. And they, people do all kinds of crazy responses to that. People relate to you differently. When they know they're a pastor, than if you were not doing that role, right? Even total strangers, even people in your 
immediate extended family. Anybody have extended relatives start to relate to you differently after they found out you were on this trajectory toward ministry leadership, mm -hmm. right? Isn't it interesting how people relate to this role? But that's why it's isolated. People are relating, most if not all the relationships in your life are relating more to your role than they are to who you actually are as a person. As just Chris, with all of that means. So you must counteract that isolation, be proactive about that. Because it's the isolation that is what leads to all kinds of difficulties for people. You have to pay attention to this. It's not going to happen on its own. You must be proactive about this. Um, and a lot of that isolation comes from the kinds of criticism that we receive. I want to suggest to you something. It's called the 70 30 rule that at least 70% of the criticism you receive as a pastor has absolutely nothing to do with you. Not a single thing. Um, that has a couple of implications, one of which is. 70% of the compliments we receive on the is either or in <laughs> So we need to remember that and be appropriately humble. But most pastors experience uh, kind of extremes of feedback. Either extreme, what we call idealization, where I'm getting really excessive compliments because people sort of see me as this sort of godlike on a pedestal type of figure. Or extreme, unrealistic, unwarranted criticism. That really isn't about you either. But neither one of those feedback forms is actually accurate about your true strengths and your true growth areas. So you have to have somewhere in your life to stay grounded in the sense of who you really are and to really feel truly known and truly seen and truly heard. Because that's likely not going to happen in most or many of the relationships in your life. Um, so what is that 70%? Well, I think a lot of it is what psychologists call transference, transferring thoughts, feelings, ways of relating um, onto the pastor. Quick, quick example, my grandfather was a Nazarene pastor of mostly small and clergy building congregations in New England his entire career. Um, and there was a gentleman in one of the small Nazarene churches in the Boston area who would just show up at the parsonage that was physically connected to the church, and some folks still live in this sort of arrangement uh, today. And he would show up unannounced in the evening, knock on the door, my grandfather opened the door, and he would just start to yell and scream at my grandfather. Just unprovoked, you know, and really verbally abusive, emotionally abusive, rage, and just out of control anger. And my dad has memories of this when he was a boy that actually were quite trouble to him and it's scary for him. You know, why is this guy from the church showing up and just raging on my father? Well, this guy would do this from time to time, and some years passed, my grandfather got called to the church, so they were literally pulling out of the driveway of the parsonage to move to the other church, and who showed up to say goodbye with this same man with his family in the car? And he came up to my grandfather and gave him a big hug and just started to, to weep and said, oh, thank you, Pastor, thank you. Who are you? In the last three, four years here, you've just done nothing but verbally abuse me, and now you're weeping that I'm weeping. I don't understand. And my dad and I started to talk about this, and this man had a very abusive, physically and emotionally abusive alcoholic father. And this was back in the days, you know, in Southern California, in some ways, you're short of bottom and don't have a therapist, right? Um, it wasn't popular, you know, nobody went to therapy back in those days. He never really worked through his own abuse history. He was really angry with that. He was really angry with that. Who did that all come out of? You know, the pastor. Transplants. You see that? You are the target. You are the lightning rod for people working through all kinds of things. Now, people aren't doing this consciously, mostly. Um, but it, it gets really wearing to the end see the end of this, and there are times when a certain kind of person out of a certain kind of brokenness will actually sexualize the transplants. Therapists are trained in this, trained to expect it, trained how to talk through it with people. Pastors often don't see this coming. So you can see the setup for the sexual misconduct for clergy. I'm lonely, I'm isolated, I'm stressed, I'm fatigued, I haven't paid attention to my marriage at home. In comes someone to my church office. Um, they think I'm the best thing since the Apostle Paul or someone. 
and I happen to find them physically attractive because after all, I'm a pastor, but I'm a person, which means I have sexuality, which means I'm going to find somebody attractive other than my spouse, if I'm honest with myself. Are you with me? And intimacy develops. I find myself starting to arrange committee meetings where I can sit next to this person a lot. Um, a hug lasts a little bit too long after church. A glance that lasts a little bit too long. Flirtatious texts start to happen. And it drifts into an inappropriate relationship. And then that becomes revealed and then the pain really starts. We all know those stories, and, and I think that's more the kind of thing that often happens rather than a, a sexual predator type person, but those folks can sometimes find their way into a clergy role as well. It's one of the reasons we do an event like this, like is trying to keep predators out of the, the position of power for the pastors. Are you with me? Um, but this business of boundaries is very complicated. Because in ministry, we often have to find ourselves in a position of always being the one to set the boundaries in most of our relationships, which gets exhausting. But it's when we're most exhausted, perhaps, that we need to be most vigilant about that. And so uh, Dr. Larry is going to take us further and deeper in understanding the nature of boundaries in personal relationships and how to do those well. Thank you, Chris. There is a handout I have. I don't know if there's one for everybody, but at least one for every family if you want to just uh, pass that around to the church. Faith Trust Institute um, out of Seattle is sort of what I was trying to some of this a number of years ago, and much of this comes from um, their work. Families are so important. Uh, just a quick follow up on what um, Dr. Adams just said. Uh, my father was clergy, a uh, professor, just like I am in an Nazarene institution. He uh, dealt with depression his whole life. Um, I gave him lists of Christian counselors because I saw I was trained, as he, he was, um, and I encouraged him to go to see a therapist. He would do it, a lot of people knew. Um, he had cancer. Uh, surgery went into a very deep depression. And one day I heard my very holy father quit suicidal because of the pastor and the training and things I knew it was. And I said, Dad, we're going to do this. I called him a doctor. And I called the doctor and told him I heard him a minute ago. My dad had to get some pretty serious um, help. I say that to say that my dad is, you know, he died a year and a half ago. 800 people showed up at his funeral because he's an extraordinary minister, extraordinary compassion he would But he would take care of it. And uh, thanks be to God, I got some help. But he was in his 70s by this time. I look back and say, I wish he would have been able to have more peace and not struggle with that by himself. And so I am a big fan of therapy. I'm a super big fan of honesty. Um, I don't like, I don't like budget stuff. And so it's probably no surprise that I'm going to use and talk about boundaries. <laughs> well, let's go back to this. Uh, look at this picture for a second. And uh, just tell me what you see. Just what, when you see this, what kind of words come to your mind? Anybody? Freedom. 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 Open. Open. Alone. Alone. Lonely. Peaceful. Peaceful.
that sort of talks to clergy and clergy families. I wanted to give you a couple of statements from the people who are in this work. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm going to burst under the stress of it all. It'd be so good to be able to share these pressures with you, but I feel like you'll not understand some of my negative feelings. You have always shown me such great love. I just feel like I'm in this alone. This is our first church, and after a year with you, I still feel so lonely. Does everyone feel this loneliness? Does it last forever? I wonder if you'll like me, and out of this concern, I overextend myself. I'm also concerned that I'm cautious from being in a parsonage for so many years, that I over-respond to events and personalities and attach strengths to others, blocking relationships. Our entire society has grown away from sharing, but there seems to be a real sense of fear to reveal one's heart, especially in ministry. There's a fear that there might be condemnation. This picture of the isolated individual has some beauty to it. And freedom is sort of a really high value in our society, right? Individual freedom to make your own choices, to decide who you love and what you do with your body and all of that. We have some pretty high values, and some of that's really beautiful in our society. Some of it makes life really, really difficult, particularly in the church, to figure out where do we draw the boundaries around relationships, around sexual relationships, just around where do I end and somebody else begin, and how do my behaviors impact others. So I want to introduce you to the idea of friendly fences or boundaries. All right, these are picket fences. Um, who, what's this gonna, what, uh, what's the picket fence going to keep out? Nobody really wants to get through, right? What's a picket fence sort of signify? Stability. We're <laughs> middle class. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's a demarcation. It just marks that somebody's boundary is here. It's not going to keep somebody out who really wants to be in. But it's going to signify to somebody that there is a limit here. You should pay attention that there's um, a place where you don't belong unless you're invited. And so all of us, there is a sanctity to ourselves. One of my favorite quotes from church history is Irenaeus of Dion, who says, and I wrote this down my first year of seminary, and it's my favorite ever, even after I too many degrees and too many books. Um, the glory of God is the human being fully alive. So the human being, this person that we've been talking about, the fullness of your life with God and the fullness of life with others is really kind of the overflow out of which ministry comes. Now we don't always feel like we're overflowing. Uh, sometimes we feel very uh, exhausted and alone. But boundaries actually say, there's something really sacred about me and my life and my time. God gave it to me. There's something really sacred about my family and my most intimate relationships. God gave these people to me for life. And I have the freedom and responsibility to put a ticket fence around them. And sometimes they know the time that you want from me, it's not yours, it's mine. Because I feel that I feel important and my life matters. And so does yours. And we as pastors have to stop asking people to leave the church after they put in a 60 hour week they can feel guilty for not putting in 60 hours of church. That's a violation of their boundaries. Their boundaries to have some flourishing, some family time. So boundaries are important for everybody. Now, this is a problematic boundary. Pick offenses don't keep anybody else. What does this one do? Probably oh, keep most people out. So some people have way too high boundaries. Keeps uh, or keeps them in. That's right. Either way. In this particular instance, the, the boundaries that, you know, you have such high boundaries, I only take emails between 9 and 9.30 and close mails. And no phone calls after the sick. Well, obviously, no pastors can survive very long with really too high boundaries. But sometimes we may be available to people, but never emotionally present. And if you met somebody like that, that probably means they've got a very high boundary. We're not recommending that either. It's finding an appropriate way to mark your uh, relational um, space. One of the issues we talked about is power. <clears throat> I don't know who feels powerful. 
Anybody? We often as clergy don't feel very powerful these days because it's a profession used to be one of those highly respected in society, not so much. But I need you to know you have tons of power, tons of power over people's lives. And you need to be very careful with that power. Who do you represent? God, the all-powerful one. So if people are transferring all that expectation on you, you have power, you can get into the hospital when people are at their most vulnerable. You can walk up and knock on the door and almost anybody in the congregation will let you in. If you say, get in my car and let's go somewhere, almost everybody in your congregation is going to in. You have lots of power. I have no idea what's going on. I think we're and one of the things we need to make sure is we have power to protect those who are vulnerable in our congregation. Uh, these folks, people who are congregants or our church members, people who interact with our churches, those who rail the catering, those who bring the supplies, those who clean the building, whatever, student staff, etc. It is a pastoral responsibility, and you have the power and responsibility to make sure that people who are vulnerable are safe and not taken advantage of, whether that's through um, not paying them well enough, whether that's not respecting the time boundaries, or uh, in this instance that we're focusing on here, not respecting personal and uh, sexual boundaries. And guess what? Legally, you're not only responsible for yourself, you're responsible for everybody that works for you, you pastors. Um, Staff members, choir directors, the pastor has to understand boundaries because you have to not only have good boundaries with others, but you have to train these folks to have some boundaries around their time. Thank goodness that church fired that youth pastor. Right? This is a really big church. It's not like it's this is a church that's decided that if we're going to be healthy together, we're going to be healthy together. Often, when somebody crosses the line and has a sexual relationship with somebody, particularly within the congregation, well, this is, we could, I could, I could spend a lot of time talking about real specific here. But often when um, these kinds of things happen, we go to defaults of saying, you know, people are human and they are, and sexual relationships happen, and if this happens, if you don't feel under the guilt about it, talk to somebody and get some help or get some clarity or call somebody in to help your congregation, it happens all the time. We don't want to make it okay, but we also don't want you to say the same or that one. We probably have any one. But often when this happens, the church defaults to some sort of excuse. The excuse is maybe a description of what happened, but they're not an excuse to say it's okay, because it's a boundary violation. It's a boundary violation that through the cross of sacred trust. So clergy misconduct, when any person in a ministerial role or leadership or pastoral counseling, whether you're ordained or not, engages in sexual conduct or sexualized behavior, uh, watch the new pastor in those texts and those Instagram likes, right? Sexualized behavior isn't just direct contact. Who engages in this kind of behavior with a congregant, client, employee, staff, student, staff member? Right, your pastor relationship, we're there to shepherd the flock, not to sleep with them. All right? Uh, you can be a sexual being, and you should be. Uh, pay attention to your sexuality. But because of all the transference and because of all the intimacy things that happen in church, I just encourage you just to get it in the back of your mind. Never are you that special. Never are you that one that has the exception. God gave me this person, so I'm the special one. I never felt these feelings before. Trust me, <coughs> lots of people have said that before. And Chris and I can tell you stories that you don't want to hear. Right? But this, this is this is the way um, crossing the boundaries can take place. All right. Um, one of the concepts that's helpful: the more power you have, is basically connected to the more resources you have. If you oversee the budget, you got a lot of power. If you oversee the staff, you got a lot of power. And when you have more power, you have potential to um, use that power against those who are more vulnerable, even if you're a super good person. Right? Just to recognize your power. Those who are vulnerable are those who have fewer resources and potential for being abused. If you have a um, 
ministry with abused um, children. You see how people are coming in with sexual addictions. If you've got a food pantry, you've got a lot of folks who are coming in with high vulnerabilities. You've got to make sure all your staff and people who are working with you know that that vulnerability and that power dynamic is just there. Oops. All right, let's just take a look at this guy. If you can't read the bottom line, it says, but his vulnerability is what I like about him. Says the bear, who's about to talk to What might make this person less vulnerable? Could do, not quite so vulnerable. Not exactly. Have a partner, do you ministry together, right? I used to tell my youth ministers, no, you're not taking that kid alone, home alone in your car, after you do but I'm just being, no, you're not doing it. No, 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 no. And I've been thinking afterwards, years later, but no, you are not going to be alone in that car with that 60-year-old. Go with somebody else. Have a car Get a parent. All right? Vulnerability. Sometimes you need to pay attention to the ministry of your members. How else could this guy be less vulnerable? Not be there. <laughs> Taco camping? <Yeah. laughs> Alright, just avoid that entirely. Anybody else? There are ways that we can protect our vulnerability by like just paying attention to our circumstances and to what's going on with us. Quick concept rules of the sea. <clears throat> If you were out on the bay today in speedboats and along comes a little sailboat, who's got to slow down? The speedboat, because the speedboat's got more power. That happens on the bay, it should happen in our lives. You're the one who's responsible. Oh, but you didn't know how she was dressed, says the new pastor. You were dressing this way and sending texts. I'm sorry. Responsibility is with the burden party. But he came on to me. He, he understood me in a way nobody else ever understood me. Well, I, I, you're the burden party. And you're going to take on this role of responsibility. You're the burden party to make sure that those boundaries, those texting, that time spent um, is um, your attention to it. And one last concept just to bring forward is part of this um, in your um, handout. I just want to build relationships. I encourage you to read the thing about dating. Help your young ones and single folks in the room and otherwise date well. You can date somebody in the church, just don't be their pastor. They can go to another church for a while with a relationship developing. You can encourage uh, great love without leaving somebody uh, vulnerable and somebody else's pastor. There's ways to do that. But this dual relationship is a, a pretty important thing to talk about. Here's an example of a dual relationship. If I'm the pastor of a church and somebody out there is my daughter's fifth grade teacher, I'm in a dual relationship. Right? I'm pastor and parent of a child in somebody else's classroom. This stuff happens all the time. Some of you probably have cousins in the church. That's a dual relationship. You're a family member and your pastor. You might have dentist in the church or whatever. You need to recognize when you have a dual relationship with someone. For instance, if my daughter or my son is I'm going to a parent-teacher conference and my kid's really not doing well and I really have an expectation that the teacher's going to give my kid extra help, because after all, I'm their pastor, and I know what they tithe and what they're not tithe in, all of a sudden you're in a messy dual relationship of expectations. So pastors have to learn to pay attention to this, and in that instance, would be able to say when you go to the parent-teacher conference, I know that you're a member of my church. I want you to know that right now when I'm sitting in front of you, I've taken off my pastor hat. And right now I'm not your pastor, I am the parent of your child. And my child only has one mom and one dad. And you know, if you have pastoral needs or have conflicts, we'll find somebody else to you know, talk to at the church. But right now I'm mom and dad. And let's just make sure that whenever we're talking to one another, just we, we should have a signal of saying chit chats. Take the pastor hat off. Because sometimes you just need to be a person to person with your family congregation or family member or family member. But you need to name those kind of relationships and be very authentic with them. As a professor, when I have students in class, if they're a small group that I'm a part of, 
And I say, right now, I'm not God, I'm not professor. Whatever happens in this small group has nothing to do with intention. If you fail a test, that I have a place to put it at. I can work with those relationships. And so you have to learn how to name those relationships. If not, the expectations will get wound up, and you can tell me stories of how this is happening in the congregation. People are not clear. You need to be clear and help people understand the good relationship thing. Because they're just not thinking in these terms. And so they expect you to befriend and have fun with me and hang out with our kids at the softball field and do this and do that. And then pastor, of course your door's going to be open to you all the time. Sometimes we can be friends and sometimes we have to say, we don't want the black ones to hang out right now. But this is really important. Because that our intimate can also become very problematic um, in relationships. And if you've had a church match or church conflict, I promise you the relationships of some sort um, have got much to mix. And they will always be there. The more really conscious you are, and the more you can set the appropriate boundaries of the conflict and the people you can do the challenge. Look at that. I'll show you one more quote. Pastors have to do such a wide range of things and often have to do things nobody else will do. Uh, 
if somebody's just got to do it. But, but there are ways of being intentional about configuring our role intentionally around our strengths and put complementary strengths around you and other pastoral staff, lay leaders, volunteers, and approach ministry as a team. It's a much more sustainable way to go. You're going to hear more about strengths tonight. Um, these are the kinds of practices we want to invite you to consider. <laughs> Cultivating Sabbath as a principle in your life, time where you literally are ceasing from work, ceasing from participating in the marketplace as a consumer, spending time away from the, the typical things that you do most of the week to allow space for relationship, to allow space for celebration, uh, to allow space to engage with something you enjoy doing. What a concept, huh? To play. Uh, one of the things that we find with pastors, pastors who find a hobby, something they enjoy doing, they can lose themselves in an activity, and it's renewing to them, that practice of flourishing pastors because it helps them take a mental break from the industry. Pastors often, even on their day off, are thinking about, ruminating about a sermon, thinking about that board meeting coming up. You're not really taking a break from that. Right, because you're mentally working. I'm really detaching in a healthy sense for a while is a really wonderful practice. Take care of your body. We just don't do this for pastors. Everybody in this room needs seven to nine hours of sleep a night, what the experts say. Regardless of how much you think you need, that's how much you need. You don't get that, you develop a sleep debt. It can lead to all kinds of cognitive and physical problems if we neglect that over time. Paying attention to nutrition, exercising, even taking a 20 minute walk every day over years can make an enormous difference in the kinds of statistics I've been showing to you. So take care of your body um, as a spiritual practice. Embrace your limits, uh, boundaries, time management. Some of you are familiar with Dallas Willard, spiritual formation writer. He, he writes about this that busy people are actually lazy, which is kind of convicting because they're not taking the time to actually plan and be disciplined with their time. Um, so it's actually a form of laziness if you really think about it. We need to be careful about that and manage our time well. Um, one of the things I suggest is to, to leave some margin in our schedule as a pastor because unpredictable things are coming. Predict the unpredictable. Something is going to fill up that 20 or 30 percent you leave unscheduled every week. You don't know exactly when or exactly what, but it will get eaten up by something. And if you don't have that margin built in there, then you're going to be overextended very easily. So build some margin in your, your time management. Um, we talked about strengths and managing your adrenaline. There are lots of ways to manage your adrenaline. We have a lot more conscious control over our adrenaline expenditure than we think that we do. And the basic principle here is that what can happen in ministry is we, we tend to just allow ourselves to react rather than learning to respond. You've heard that distinction before between reacting and responding. We can start to allow ourselves to just react to the five alarm fire, um, or partly react to everything as if it's a five alarm fire indiscriminately, as opposed to really distinguishing is this really a five alarm fire? If it is, I'll let myself go into that mode, but maybe this isn't something I need to react or respond to at all, even though someone else thinks I need to. I, I decide that. Right? You decide what a crisis is, not the person who's coming to you and what they feel like is a crisis. May or may not be. Um, I heard a great sermon recently on the call of Moses to ministry, the burning bush story, you know the story. Um, and apparently, this pastor had done some exegetical homework. Um, apparently, that it was not unusual for a particular kind of bush, even to this day, in that part of the world to spontaneously combust in the desert when it's hot. So it may not have been unusual for Moses to see that kind of bush on fire. What was unusual is that it wasn't consumed and then started speaking to it. Right? So what the point that this pastor made, and I love this, is that sometimes ministry is about learning which fires to pay attention to. Isn't that good? Not every single thing demands you go into high reactive mode. And if we're not careful, we can do that indiscriminately and we're just over our adrenaline like crazy and we really don't want to do it. Uh, 
because we're not really determining what level of response is required. So you, you can choose how much adrenaline you're going to allow yourself to extend if you think about it and are conscious about it. And doing a conscious process of talking yourself through that has actually been proven in research to decrease blood pressure, to decrease obesity, all the kinds of things we're talking about. Okay, and finally, you have a lot of relationships in your life as a pastor. And that's a wonderful thing. Um, it's a challenging thing, but there are certain kinds of relationships you need to pay attention to. Um, first of all, your family. I want to suggest to you you make covenant commitments to your spouse if you're married and to your children and your parents that you have not made your foundation. You have a commitment there that God is calling you on. Um, even if your congregation is trying to pull you away from that commitment in terms of the demands, um, really want to encourage you not to go back to the For a whole host of reasons. Part of that is because that's that's a source of strength and sustenance for any pastor because that's where you're truly go. That's where you're when it's healthy, that's where your true intimacy is. Right? And it's out of that overflow that Rebecca was talking about, out of the overflow of that intimacy and the family that you can engage in healthy ways with all these other complicated relationships. Um, with the congregation, boundaries are important increasingly. Most of us don't learn how to do conflict well from our family that we grew up in. And we have to really get some training and how to do that well. And so there are a number of things that specifically for pastors uh, that have been created where you can take yourself through conflict resolution training. We really encourage you to do that. It's, you don't have to be looking for conflict in the industry. It will come looking for you sooner or later, right? No matter who you are, what church you're in, it's going to happen. And so you want to be equipped with some skills. There are some skills you can learn uh, to, uh, to work through conflict in construction ways. Personal friends really encourage every pastor to have a personal friendship outside of your ministry and context. Someone that does not go to your church. Not in your congregation. A buddy, a pastor, a friend. But you that. Outside of that context. Why? Because you can genuinely just be a person there. You can just be who you are. You don't have to be conscious of, of being measured and careful in your role. You can just be yourself. You can laugh spontaneously. You can vent about the church board member that drives you crazy. Or you, can to, you can do whatever you need to do and be accepted in that friend. You need that friendship in your life. One study suggests that 70, 74% of pastors do not have a single person in their life to be the first person in their life. Isolation. You've got to counteract that on purpose. Cultivate that friendship. And then also cultivating denominational relationships with leaders uh, actually helps you be healthier. Having a mentor at whatever stage you're in, even I think you heard uh, John Calvin say this morning that Ruben Welsh is still his mentor. And John's, you know, he can see retirement someday, you know, not too distant future. He's still being mentored. Isn't that cool? You want to find a mentor every stage in your career. And then finally, what we call a community of practice or getting together with other pastors. It's one of the beautiful things about what happens in an event like this. You need to do this kind of thing on a regular basis with some other pastors and allow that over time to develop to a place of trust, to a place of accountability. Um, that may mean meeting with some pastors who aren't Nazarene. That might end up feeling safer uh, to some of you. It can happen when we're all uh, Nazarene pastors. Sometimes it's a little more challenging because there's a sense of competition or I'm afraid you're gonna be my guest someday so I don't really want to share some stuff with you. You know how it is. Um, but you need to find a community of practice and, and, uh, and for spouses of pastors, that's also important for you to hang out with other spouses of pastors in a way that, um, that breathes life into you because you can step outside of this role. You don't have to explain to other pastors or other pastor spouses what it's like. You just know, right? You can share the stories, the funny things that happen, uh, the challenging things that happen. Even across the nomination, when I see pastors get together, we start to talk about what are the practical realities and the stresses and strains, the theological differences. A very common experience. Catholic priests, Episcopal priests, Nazarene pastors all have similar kinds of 
things that they can do with relation with people. And so it's very important for you to do that. Um, we are right at lunch. We probably have time for one or two questions. That might, the whole group might benefit at four. If anybody has one, or feel free to come up and ask us. Anybody have a question, a burning question you have to ask before lunch? Besides where's the food? Well, let me pray for us for lunch and then we'll let you go. Thank you for your attendance, even though we're all hungry. Um, God, we thank you for these men and women who have called. And God, I just pray for our protection over them. Would you give them wisdom and discernment? Protect them from the kinds of temptations and pitfalls that lead to such painful consequences for pastors and families and for your church. And we just ask for protection and wisdom. And God, we thank you for the food we're about to receive. Bless those that prepared it. We're mindful of God that today we will have people who are going to come in for the rest of the morning. Help us to steward our resources well and be a part of the rule and the rule of the to get to those who will be in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. Enjoy lunch.